So I'm going to start with the fact, or I'm going to start with the stat. Uh, Fortune magazine recently claimed that there will be more data created in the next three years than has been created in the last 30 years. Over the next three years, 448 zettabytes of data will be created and replicated. And so the next question that you're going to ask me is, what's a zettabyte? So let's put some context on that. Zettabyte, 448 with 21 zeros. It's a big number. You're still asking me, what's a zettabyte? So let me put some reality on that. So imagine every person on this planet consuming prime video for 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for three years. That's 448 zettabytes. That's what I call binge watching. Yeah? Now, my son loves video, but even he can't get through that much content. Now, that's data growth alone. When we look at the significant growth in compute capacity, we've got a whole new level of, of capability that's growing. We look at our largest EC2 ultra clusters at the moment. We're delivering 6.3 exaflops of capacity. That's more than enough for most people. And then if we look at the slides that Alessandro just shared, we look at model growth, we look at ML capability, we're seeing a tenfold increase, not just in model size, but also in the underlying techniques that are driving machine learning. So as the slide says, we're truly at an inflection point for machine learning. Data growth, the compute power, and the ML techniques are driving this inflection point. And there's probably no organization on this planet that probably couldn't benefit from machine learning at scale. As they look to transform their experience that they deliver to their customers, as they look to transform the way they operate, as they become truly data-driven and ML-powered. But there's a new kid on the block. There's a new technology, there's a new buzzword that has come out, certainly in the last few months. And generative AI is now not just dinner table conversation, it's boardroom conversation. And we have a belief at AWS that generative AI will power many of the future applications as you look to deliver on whole new experiences and as you look to transform your organizations to get the power of ML and do awesome things with that. So what do we mean by generative AI? I didn't choose to take my image and turn it into something else and didn't think it was fair on you. I created some other nice imagery for you. So generative AI, it's the idea of taking something old and making it new. It's novel content that we're creating. It's a derivative work. So how do we take ideas, conversations, stories, images, videos, music, use them to create new versions? We're powering very, very large machine learning models pre-trained on huge content stores, large, large corpus of data, many, many terabytes of content to create what we call foundation models that are then being used to generate net new content, these derivative works. At AWS, we're not new to the world of machine learning. We've been doing it for a few years. We've seen some of our customers talk to their experience on AWS as they've looked to leverage the power of this capability. We've been on a journey with quite a few customers at this stage to look at how do we help them transform? How do we help them gain access to ML at scale and make it accessible and consumable across a whole range of different personas. Data scientists, data engineers, ML ops engineers. We've been on this journey for a little while. And we're truly transforming the way, again, across many industries, many sectors, that organizations are powering the future of, of their capabilities. They're truly transforming. They're looking at whole new ways of working. And again, we're not seeing very many industries or sectors where ML can't be applicable. We've got the broadest and deepest capabilities across our three layers of the stack. Whether you're at the lowest level with our frameworks, custom silicone, as Alessandro just mentioned, our middle layer with SageMaker, managing the end-to-end -end process, the ML lifecycle, everything from annotating data all the way through to deploying those models and managing those in operation, in production, over the long term. All the way up to our highest level of AI services, helping to really democratize and drive ML consumption to developers with no ML skills. So we've been in this journey for a while, 
and we've been helping our customers on their journeys. Where does generative AI sit? So most of us understand this notion of AI. It's this idea that you know, we're allowing computers to essentially mimic what humans do in some rudimentary form. It could even be as something simple as business logic, business rules, conditional logic, if then else statements. Within that, we then look at machine learning the discipline within the broader space, the umbrella category of AI, look at machine learning. We're changing that paradigm. We're shifting from code generating data to data essentially generating code. In many cases, supervised techniques where we're, we're tagging our data, we're actually giving the outcome and we're learning from that. We're learning what the model should actually create. Deep learning has become a little bit of a thing, certainly very popular over the last decade. AlexNet, I think, was on Alessandro's slide back in 2012, really drove that first shift around the resurgence of neural networks and the massive growth around novel new architectures that have massively shifted the way that we consume ML today. One of the nice things about deep learning and, and the neural network architecture is we can use unsupervised training. We don't need a lot of supervised data. We don't even need to necessarily worry about features within our models. The network, in some cases, will take care of that for us. In 2017, we introduced the transformer. The world was introduced to the transformer architecture, and that massively shifted things up. And so while generative AI is not new, prior to the transformer, it was certainly a thing. Most people remember deep fakes. You know, they're essentially generative AI. What we're now seeing is this new category fueled by the transformer that is allow allowing us to do this at scale and actually tackle some of the problems that we had previously around things like context length and really just having an you know, understanding of history so that we can create some really novel new content, text, images, audio, that type of thing. So how do these foundation models work? Well, it starts with a lot of data, as we've said. In many cases, if we look at models like GPT-3, probably 45 terabytes of text data. It's a big amount of data. It's internet scale data. We're taking sources like Common Crawl or the Pile and actually taking those and using those to fuel these early foundation models. Now, the nice thing is that, again, we're, we're using unsupervised training. We don't need to label that data. The model is extracting the essence of what it's, has been reflected in that data to create a foundation model. So we pre-train to create this foundation model. Now, foundation models we're hearing are getting larger and larger. My personal view is that trend will probably curtail. We'll actually start to see far smaller models as we look to knowledge density within those, those networks. But what we're now seeing is through adaptation, through fine tuning to a given domain or a given problem space, we can create some really novel outcomes from this foundation model. So we can look at text generation, summarization, information extraction, Q&A, a whole range of tasks that have been taken from a generalized model and made very specific to your world and your problem. When we look at the types of models available, and we've seen some examples on stage already today, text is a great one. So text to text models, we're taking an input in this case, summarize articles on the impact of walking on heart health. And unsurprisingly, 10,000 steps a day are recommended. Everyone got their 10,000 in today. Pretty large conference center. I'm hoping that most of you got your steps in. Looking at things like text or embedding, how do we take text and then convert that into a vector, into an embedding, a representation of that text? Not just the words, but also the meaning. And how do we use that then to infer new representation or new meaning? So in this case, we're looking at things like hand soap refills, hand soap dispenser, hand soap antibacterial. If you've ever used Amazon.com, if you've ever typed any query into the search box, you're using these kind of embeddings. You know, we build a huge foundation model that sits behind the scene that powers Amazon search. It uses our product descriptions, our product imagery, our product reviews to create the best search model possible so that when you're interested in going in and typing in, sell me a pink guitar, it will give you all of the best pink guitars possible. And then finally, we're looking at these novel new multimodal models, whether it be text to image or even the other way around, image to text, text to audio, text to video. Text to video is the next big thing. Just you wait. It's out there. It's coming. 
you know, whatever social media platform you choose to consume, it's going to be full of spam videos very quickly that have been foundationally generated. So if I'm interested in a photograph of an astronaut riding a horse on Mars, I can type that into a prompt, whether that's in stability.ai with their stable diffusion models, whether that's using a DALI model, whether that's using mid-journey. I can get a picture of a horse with an astronaut on it riding on Mars, because that's where all the best astronauts ride their horses. Why foundation models? Why is it a big thing? Why is it suddenly taking the world by storm? Well, if we look at the existing or the traditional way of building a model, we start with labeled data. And for anyone that has built large-scale models, you'll know that labeling data is the most exotic and the most sexy and the, the job that most data scientists really love to do. It's where they spend all of their time. It really gets them up in the morning. It's, it's actually super fun. It's not fun at all. Labeling data is actually a pain. But we build from that label data. We create these models. And from those models, we then create problem-specific Sorry, from that data, we create problem-specific applications, such as te text generation, summarization, and so on. With foundation models, we kind of shift things up. We turn things on their head. We go from unlabeled data. And so when we're looking at internet scale data, we're looking at many, many images. We're looking at many, many text documents as a source to these foundation models. The ability to actually extract the essence of those documents without having to label them is a massive advantage. That allows us to pre-train our base foundation model. We then might apply some adaptation. We might do some reinforcement learning with human feedback. We might do some customization, maybe some compression of that model. But we're essentially taking it and then turning it into thing, something that's more domain-specific or problem-specific to answer a particular problem. But it's the same base model from the same base data. It's transformative. It's really shifting the way that we think about machine learning. And it's allowing us to take a single model and through adaptation apply it to many downstream problems. And in many cases, that ad adaptation is very easy and requires very little data to actually get some amazing results. What kind of a result? So you name it, everyone's trying it right now. And one thing I would say is, while generative AI has captured the imagination, it's certainly captured the attention of the world. I think everybody has been talking about it, or almost everybody, for the last few months. There are a couple of examples where you would perhaps choose not to use generative AI. And I think recognizing that it is not the solution to every problem is definitely a good place to start. But on the whole, when we look at across a whole range of different industries or verticals, whether you're doing chatbots or all the way down to chip design, there's something in it when it comes to generative AI. So over the last couple of months, and actually as part of our journey in this space, as AWS has been working with our customers to look at how do they build ML at scale? You know, how do we help them with some of the challenges of design, build, train, deploy, manage their models? Specifically, when it comes to generative AI, there are five things that come up that most of our customers are looking for. And so I wanted to spend the last section of this presentation really just talking about how we've addressed some of these challenges. So starting off with flexibility, one of the things that we've been told and recognizing that today's best model and your definition of what best means is your choice, today's best model may not be tomorrow's best model. And so irrespective of where you're sourcing your foundation model from, our customers are looking for choice. They need a straightforward way to find and access high performance models that are going to deliver the best results for their particular problem today. And so some of you be aware of the fact that last month we announced a number of new capabilities, the first of which was Amazon Bedrock. And so Bedrock is a managed service, fully managed service, that requires zero management on your behalf, serverless in nature, no, no need to actually manage any of the back-end infrastructure that gives you flexibility in access to those foundation models and delivers it essentially through an API. It's a single API call. Summarize this text, generate some new text, look at the sentiment of this content. What we give you is a choice of foundation model. And so whether you're interested in models from AI21 Labs, you're interested in models from Anthropic or Stability, you have the choice as to which foundation model you want to leverage and use today. And over time, we will continue to add 
to that list of models. But we do this securely. And so one of the big concerns that our customers have is, I don't want to give my data to the foundation model provider. When I'm running inference against this model, I want to ensure that you're not using my data to go enhance your model. And so we privately access that model. We do it within your own VPC. And we put in place the standard security controls that we have at our, at our hands with AWS, IAM roles and, and similar, to ensure that what you're building is secure and your data is protected. On the flip side, we're also protecting the foundation model provider. They've invested significant resource in building that model in the first place. And so we're also protecting the IP of the foundation model provider. Also integrated with standard tooling. So for example, if you want to use SageMaker experiments and manage experiments through that, again, with foundation models, very possible. And so as I mentioned, a number of foundation models from third parties. But we also announced last month Amazon Titan. And so Titan is our entry into the marketplace around these large models, these foundational models. And today, with text Titan and Titan embeddings, we've got the first two generations of the mo those models that we're going to make available to our customers. So that's the first thing, is choice, flexibility, security, making sure that we can do this at scale, but with minimal effort on your behalf, we're taking care of that as a fully managed serverless service. Second one is secure customization. So as I mentioned, these foundation models, while they're very powerful, are actually really good at generalizing. They're not very good at anything. They're generally good at lots of things. So one of, one of my friends and colleagues, Julian Simon from Hugging Face, I think he describes it as they're a million miles wide and they're an inch deep. I kind of like that analogy. And so our customers are looking for a way to take these foundation models and build on them. How do we start to provide fine tuning, again, securely, so that we can customize that model to my world, my problem, my domain? And do that in a way, again, that allows us to trust and have confidence in that data. So the ability to actually take those, those models, uh, as simply as adding content to an S3 bucket, whether that be documents or images, I can now find, fine tune these foundation models. And so if I'm looking to learn from documents I've created previously, if I'm looking to be able to pick up on brand voice, on tone, on knowledge of my product set, my world, my domain, through fine tuning with a relatively small number, we're talking hundreds to maybe a 1,000 examples, we can actually fine tune these models and actually generate a privately customized model, a version for you that, again, is accessed and managed as a fully managed service with no management on your part when it comes to infrastructure. One of the things that I started with is this explosion in data growth, 448 zettabytes. Also looking at model complexity. And so to manage that, to really get your hands around, how do we do ML at scale? A GPU or accelerated compute capacity is something that is becoming more and more relevant. And so one of the things that we're striving to do is, again, provide choice, provide accessibility, provide access to the right hardware platform to be able to run foundation models either as a consumer or as a fine tuner, and again, do that at scale at the right price point to make that effective. While some of you would have seen or heard of AWS Inferentia, this is our inference-based accelerator based on hardware that we acquired uh, actually, a team that we acquired, the Annapurna Labs, they've been working on this for a number of years. The first version of Inferentia has been available for some time and has been really good at helping to, for traditional ML, accelerate what's possible. In the realm of generative AI, in the realm of large foundation models, when we're looking at huge numbers of parameters, we're actually looking at the point where these models no longer reside within the RAM of a single instance. We're looking at scaling over multiple instances. Technology like AWS Trainium that we announced last month gives you 50% saving on training cost, 50% faster in many cases compared to a comparable EC2 instance. When we're looking at inference, and this is often the, the big misknown or the unknown, training might cost you a certain amount of money. It might take you a certain amount of time. But the long tail is inference. You're going to spend far more money long term as you serve those models and actually put the answer of the inference operation in the hands of your end user, whatever that looks like. And so in Frencher 2, 
is certainly our answer as far as how do we, again, hit that price performance where we're looking at, again, 40% faster and often a lot cheaper than our existing EC2 instances. So massive investment in this space, and this is one of the things that our customers are looking for. Great partnership around this space, and you know, we're, we're working hard to ensure that all of the top models from Hugging Face are available and accessible through both Inferentia and Trainium. Easiest way to build foundation models. So again, once I've decided that maybe a man fully managed service doesn't meet my needs, I actually want more flexibility, I want more customization, I might want to be able to integrate with standard tooling like SageMaker and S3 and a range of other AWS services. And so today, if you're looking to take on um, a more customized solution, if you're looking to build custom models and actually integrate within a broader space, SageMaker Jumpstart is the place to start today. And so, again, some commonality in the types of foundation models that are available, but also additional open source models from the likes of Hugging Face are available through SageMaker Jumpstart to get started today. And so if you're looking to finely tune, customize, or build these models within to your own applications, and you want to go beyond what a managed service or a managed API can give you, SageMaker Jumpstart is the place to go. And we get the benefit of all of the goodness of SageMaker as an end-to-end -end platform, you know, driving that level of robustness, repeatability, automation that we get from some of the MLOps capabilities, but also things like low code, no code, the ability to actually accelerate deployment of models into production and keep them there. Lastly, there are some organizations that just want to use this technology for good and actually get to access and use foundation models in new ways. And so one of the other announcements we made last month was Amazon Code Whisperer. And so Code Whisperer is a, uh, it's a coding tool or a coding assistant on steroids that's built using foundation model technology. It's using generative AI, built in many cases from lots of external code, but actually from the Amazon code base. So all of the code that we built across many languages is used and embedded within this generative model so that we can do things like automated code generation from a single comment. So we're changing the dynamic. For many developers, it's really quite hard to convince them to comment their code. Now, if you write well self-describing code, maybe you don't need comments. But actually, we're now starting with a comment, and we're generating code from a comment. Literally, a line of code, parse a CSV file, dump the contents out into an S3 bucket. That's my comment. The code gets generated. It takes a split second to do it. But we also scan for vulnerabilities. We make sure that code is secure. And we also ensure that where necessary, we actually flag code that remembers open source. And we look then for attribution. We look for that sourcing to ensure that you, you're remaining compliant and you're, using, you're abiding by any licensing terms. For an internal test that we ran, so we ran a preview internally for our own developer organizations, 27% of the team that actually took part in that pilot were more likely to actually be successful in coding what they'd been asked to code with less errors. And at the same time, they were 57% faster a massive, massive uplift in developer productivity. This is using the power of generative AI and these large models trained on lots and lots of code across many languages, running within environments like VS Code or PyCharm, and just using that as a plugin to accelerate and drive massive productivity from a developer standpoint. Wherever you are on your journey, whether you're looking to access a fully managed service, whether you're looking to build your own foundation model, and I would question Maybe that's not a good thing to do. Some will do it. If you're looking to fine tune an existing model to your problem space, your domain, or you're looking to just tap into the power of generative AI through the tools that we have like Code Whisperer, please check out these web pages. So the first one will take you to our external web page. The second one is our blog post announcement that we made last month around Bedrock, Titan, and our inferential training announcements. And the third one is actually a set of cool videos. If anyone knows him or have had a chance to meet him, Werner Vogel is the CTO at Amazon. He released a set of videos recently around generative AI. They're pretty informative. They're pretty accessible. Even your grandmother could watch them. Time is now, as every other audience, as, as every other speaker has said. You know, skills builder, if you're looking to really get into this space, skills builder is a place to start. Whether it's building core or skills or actually getting certified, and getting access to peer-recognized, but also industry-recognized certifications. Go and get yourself onto Skills Builder. I'd ask you to follow up 
and fill out your session survey. A whole bunch of different ways to get in touch with us down here. Generative AI is super cool, super interesting. There's lots to do in this space. Speak to your account team, speak to your account rep, get involved, find out what's possible, do it on AWS. Thank you for your time, really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of Summit, and thank you again. <laughs>